<laughs> My name is Mary O'Connell, and I'm the president pro tem of the Old Bridgewater Historical Society. And I'd like to point out a few of the other board members that are here. I see Kathy Wolf, our treasurer, O'Brien, our vice president pro tem. Bob Wood is here somewhere. He's on the board. There he is, <laughs> like Bob. Uh, and Diane Badger on the board in the back. So, welcome. This is the first time in a long, long time that we have had an in-person event. And we're really thrilled to be able to do this again. Um, we do require that everybody masks up, and I'll be pulling my mask right back up as soon as I finish speaking. Um, in the meantime, if anybody would like to join the Old Bridgewater Historical Society, we would be very happy to have you join. We have sign-up cards over there on the desk. And just keep in mind that this is a very small organization and we are completely supported by donations, by dues, and by fundraisers. And we really have not been able to have a fundraiser in a while, so it's been a struggle to get through this time. So anyway, here's Dr. O'Neill. He's a graduate of Boston College and Boston University. Is it Dr. It's not Dr. No, Dr. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's okay. This is Mr. O'Neill. This is Stephen. <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> he is currently the executive director of the Hanover Historical Society. He's taught at Suffolk University since 2005 in the history department, <clears throat> where he has taught the history of piracy, material culture, the history of Plymouth Colony, public history and cultural heritage, and history curating and exhibiting. O'Neill was the associate director and curator of collections at Pilgrim Hall Museum in Plymouth. He has been a guest curator for exhibits on New England pirates at the Bostonian Society and Heritage Museums and Gardens. And he has lectured widely on Plymouth Colony history and more. He just finished a cemetery tour over in Halifax. That was about a week ago, right? Mm -hmm. And he is the guest curator at the Alden House in Duxbury. He has a very lengthy resume, and I <laughs> bust some things off. I would point out that we're trying to get into the cemetery tour game, and we're in the process of researching a local cemetery in West Bridgewater right now, and we hope to be able to offer a cemetery tour in the spring. So. Keep it in your heads or write it down on the calendar and follow us on Facebook. Call for volunteers. Volunteers. <laughs> we're looking for volunteers. Uh, we need people who have some, some time. To, oh, the cemetery tour thing. And yeah, to help. help, Sarah. Yes. <laughs> if anybody has a good, loud voice and they would like to actually <laughs> do the cemetery tour, we will have a script. But we also need people to help write the scripts. Actually, Diane Badger, the lady way in back, is in charge. And uh, she's the one that you would talk with if you're interested in doing some research for it or actually doing the tour. Did I cover everything, Kim? Yep. <laughs> okay. So I've talked long enough, and Stephen, you're on. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, cemetery tours are always big, especially this time of year. Um, everybody loves it. Uh, I spent three plus hours in First Parish Cemetery yes in Norwell yesterday. We did a tour where groups went around and they, we had actors portraying the people who were buried in the cemetery. So we had a soldier from the 54th, we had two boys who were out uh, duck hunting and were killed in the Portland Gale and buried together. And we had Pulitzer Prize winning uh, author John Cheever, um, it was right there. So people really liked it. We had over 100 some odd people. So, um, Cemeteries are a great sort of introduction to what I'm going to be talking about today, which is maps, landscapes. Um, a few years ago, when I got to Hanover Historical Society, I found that we have this beautiful surveyor's compass. Uh, it had been misidentified as a, a seafaring compass, but I did more research on it. And you'll see a picture of it in a little while. It's a sort of more uh, artistic photo of it right then. And what I discovered is that in 1794, Massachusetts required every town to create a new survey of the boundaries. And all several hundred maps that were created, plus Maine,
time have been digital. So these are hand-drawn maps. Sometimes the Sometimes it's not known. Sometimes the maps are really elaborate with all sorts of little decorations. Some of them not. They're just the basic things. Small display at the Stetson House called Distance and Direction. And a course in how you do surveying. And a lot of what was done in the Surveys were originally done for properties, um, and the 90s, the survey we'll talk about today, they still, what they did is still with us today. When we buy property, we buy it in acres. You never use acres for anything else, but acres comes out of the older measurements that were used in making these surveys. Um, I have to explain to third graders when they come through that they measured in rods, links, and chains rather than feet or miles. So this was a, a really fun opportunity. And the maps um, are all online uh, from the Mass Archives through Digital Commonwealth. And they're really fascinating uh, documents. I can see you've put out some wonderful old maps of the Bridgewaters here for today. Um, maps are works of art. They're works of science and skill. They're also particularly historic maps really fun to try to compare what the geography and the landscape was, say, 200, 300 years ago to what it is now. With the use of Google Maps, of course, you can do all sorts of fun things. Um, but it, what's most surprising is the accuracy of these old maps that were created. So in the May session, 1794, uh, the, the Massachusetts General Court, they passed Chapter 101. And part of it states, whereas an accurate map of this commonwealth will tend to facilitate and promote such information and improvements as will be favorable to its growth and prosperity and will otherwise be highly useful and important on many public and private occasions. A little wordy. I actually cut this down quite a bit. Uh, resolved that the inhabitants of the several towns and districts in the commonwealth caused to be taken by their selectmen or some other suitable person or persons appointed for that purpose, accurate plans of their respective towns or districts upon a scale of 200 rods to an inch. And copies had to be delivered uh, to uh, the survey, had to be lodged in the secretary's office free of expense to the common Good Carlton, um, 1795. Osgood Carlton was a cartographer, and he made other maps of Boston through the 1790s and into the 1800s. Now, the cartouche is pretty impressive, but the map he creates is even better. <laughs> you can see this, um, it's a little bit more colorful. You can see he has outlined Boston proper up here, and then outlined all the islands in the harbor and going over up towards Chelsea that were part of the city of Boston at the time. He didn't do a very detailed one because Boston is such a large uh, community, but you can see the wonderful details all around it. Cambridge, Roxbury, Dorchester, down towards Quincy, and out into the islands, out by Hull. The map is one of the more elaborate ones. Most of the maps that were created were fairly simple. Um, but that act also required the surveyors to list out certain features, ponds, uh, roadways, distance from Boston, distance from the Shire town like Plymouth or Taunton, uh, and also what sort of manufactories are in each town. Boston, of course, is full of all these wonderful manufactories. He lists, uh, right there next to the cartouche, 18 houses of worship, six public school houses, one sawmill, two grist mills, one chocolate mill, sounds fun, one carding mill, uh, 12 rope walks, one furnace, one pottery, my favorite, 33 distilleries <laughs> in Boston alone, good old days, five sugar refineries, uh, one glass manufactory, uh, one uh, cloth manufactory, one twine manufactory, two spermaceti, 
uh, manufacturers, two tallow manufacturers, one comb manufacturer, one glue manufacturer, one theater, and one bank. Everything you need, right? All those distilleries. I wish he had listed the number of uh, taverns. That would have been a great <laughs> statistic. But you can see that this is designed for the purpose of the leaders of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth. 1795, we're a new nation. Everything has changed for the people of, of the, the former colonies. They are now, they're no longer British subjects, no longer subjects of a monarch or a crown. They're citizens of a new republic. Things are very different. Uh, yesterday when I was talking about the, the cemetery, the first parish cemetery, I pointed out to people older places for burials were always called burial grounds or burial places. Now, early 19th century, a change to the 1800s, they're cemeteries, meaning sleeping places. The language on the gravestones goes from being, here lies buried the body of, to in memory of. And the designs, you get away from the wonderful old winged skulls and crossed bones, to urns and willows, to you know, carved marble forms. And this is just cemeteries. The revolution changes everything, decorative arts, the economics of Massachusetts, and of all the other towns. So these new surveys uh, are undertaken by every single town in the Commonwealth. So I had some friends head out into a field, and we took some photos. This is actually uh, what's called Sylvester Field in Hanover, down by Four Corners. And or just earlier this year, the town approved a large CPC grant and we were able to purchase it for the Wildlands Trust. This is one of the last untouched 18th century landscapes in Hanover. Originally, it went right down to the North River, right to where the shipyards were. So this field uh, is basically the last remaining really untouched spot that shows what Hanover was like for the first 200 years. And driving you know, through the Bridgewaters today, you can see where there are still the old farms. You can still see where the older roads are or where the, the modern roads have straightened the, the, these older roads. So using the geography and using these maps is a wonderful way to find out the layers in the geography itself. Um, these guys were having a great time portraying 1790s. Now, surveying had been around for quite some time. Of course, you know, going back to ancient Rome, for the, Ameri for the colonies, the, one of the most famous surveyors was a very young, late teenage, early 20-something George Washington. His first job was to go out and survey properties in Virginia. Um, the most famous surveyors, Charles Mason, Jeremiah Dixon, laying out the Mason-Dixon line, the boundary between Pennsylvania and Maryland below it, which then becomes very famous during the Civil War. But they were doing that in the 40s, 1740s and 1750s. Um, uh, and then the 1760s, Lewis and Clark, same type of technology, use surveying equipment when they head out on their expedition throughout the Louisiana Territory uh, from 1804 to 1806. And what they're using is something like that. That's the surveyor's compass in the collection at Hanover. It's really a fantastic um, little piece because it was made by John Bailey. John Bailey lived in Hanover. Um, his father was Colonel John Bailey, um, who was the head of the Massachusetts Second Regiment throughout the Revolution. Now, John Bailey II was a clockmaker. He made the works, he did the engraving, and he hired all sorts of people to create the cabinetry for these wonderful tall clocks. John Bailey clocks are in a lot of museum collections. They're in, um, uh, I have one in the Stetson House, the Hanover Historical Society. So they're really fascinating. Bailey was also a bit of a tinkerer, like a lot of people in the, right after the Revolution because the biggest trading partner, England, is no longer trading with this new nation, Americans get very inventive. John Bailey creates a little steam-powered machine 
to turn meat on a spit in front of a fireplace. Uh, the original patent, uh, the, the forms uh, were burned in the patent uh, library fire in the early 19th century, but his original model is in the Smithsonian. Uh, and, you know, you can just imagine, here's this clockmaker trying to make this little steam engine to turn meat on a spit in front of the fireplace. Pretty inventive. Now, Bailey is known for hiring several of his brothers, several of his sons. His son, John Bailey III, will become a clockmaker in himself uh, in his own career down towards New Bedford. This one is actually engraved right on the face, John Bailey, Hanover. So you can see it's kind of fascinating little piece that led to this story about looking at all of these old maps. Um, Bailey also rather interestingly, was a Quaker. He was a member of the Society of Friends, and he's buried in the um, Quaker Meeting House uh, burying ground over in North Pembroke. His son actually was evicted by a Society of Friends because his son, who was also a Quaker, was casting cannonballs during the Revolution. <laughs> so Quakers are pacifists, and they took that very seriously. So to do this measurement to measure out all these boundaries. A lot of the towns already had sort of rough maps or descriptions, but some of the old deeds from the 19th century. You've got directions like go four degrees west to the pile of stones, go five degrees south to the big red oak tree, it doesn't help us nowadays, but this was how a lot of these original properties were defined and laid out. Now, using a surveyor's compass, they could find the right direction, but they had to have landmarks. So oftentimes there are still boundary markers out uh, on the boundaries between towns. Um, one of my board members is actually one of the few people left who knows where they all are and is actually required to go out and mark the bounds, walk the bounds of the town. These markers were sometimes noticed in the maps, sometimes noticed in some of the other deeds and prop property um, titles at the time. But you have to imagine that they're doing this. They're writing the map, at the, drawing the map at the same time, and then they have to lay everything out. So you've got to measure all of this. So somebody has to pull out a chain. This is the unit of measurement. And on the right is... It is a measuring chain developed early 17th century. Um, a chain... 100 metal links. 0.92 inches long, so one chain equaled four rods, uh, which equaled 66 feet, or 22 yards. Equaled 80 chains, and one acre equaled 10 square chains. There'll be a quiz afterwards. <laughs> I literally, to figure out a lot of these older forms of measurement, had to graft, a, you know, just sort of graph all this out. We still, here in the United States, we're one of the last who don't use the metric system, but we use these older imperial measurements. Um, an acre, when we buy property, if we buy an acre or two with a home, an acre traditionally was the amount of land tillable by one man with one ox in one day. So that's the, the origin of our property measurements. Now, we still use others. Uh, an acre is traditionally one chain by one furlong. And a furlong is 660 feet. Um, and that would measure 10 square chains. So this long, narrow acre, that's the original design of how much you could plow with an ox and a plow in one day. Um, yeah, you can go on. One, one furlong is one-eighth of a mile, 660 feet, 220 yards, 40 rods, 10 chains. You can get really fun. <laughs> uh, I'd love to try to figure out how to, uh, you know, m 
graph all of these older measurements out. You figure nowadays, you know, we're so used to just using miles or feet. We know yardage mostly because of football uh, and acres because of property. But go to these old deeds and you will see these types of measurements uh, listed out in all the text that's on them. And these measurements were used by surveyors throughout the, the United States, adopted in the Land Ordinance of 1785. The Land Ordinance of 1785 created a regular square grid pattern that started with the old Northwest Territories, uh, Indiana, Ohio, um, Illinois, those states out there. So when you fly over and you see that regular grid pattern and all that farmland in Indiana or Ohio, that comes straight out of the 1780s and 90s in this period of the New Republic when they are starting to measure everything out organized and orderly. Okay. And on, as you can sort of see here, using those chains, boy, once you get a knot in them, forget about it. It's, it's rough work. So you can imagine measuring out the entire, Mason and Dixon, measuring out the entire border of Pennsylvania and trying to keep that straight, going through hills, going through woods, measuring out with chains. You know, so once you measure out one chain, you bring it up, measure out the next one. It's long, it's tiring work. Uh, even to do the surveys of the towns around here. Now remember, Bridgewater in 1795 is not just Bridgewater, it's all four towns. Bridgewater, West and East, and Brockton. Imagine walking the entire boundary trying to measure it out. It'll take you a while. Hanover is a little smaller. <laughs> but this is the example uh, that was created for Hanover. And you can see, not much. What you have on this, and these, these are not big. I mean, these maps are you know, just a little bit larger than a standard piece of paper. So you can see, here's Hanover, uh, Pembroke to the south, the Historical Society. You can see the original portion that was taken from Abington over here, and Situate is on the other side of the Third Herring Brook. Pretty basic, pretty straightforward. Um, some of the others for towns like Situate have a little bit more information, uh, you know, details drawn in them. I spent hours going through these maps to see, you know, how different the landscape might be from current landscapes, and these are fascinating. Hanover, for instance, I mean, we still have the dams at the same spots on the North River and on the Indian Head River. We still have the locations of dams where the grist mills were on Third Herring Brook, um, where the forges are. Hanover and a lot of the other towns around here had iron furnaces, forges. Um, blacksmithing was a big industry in this area. Um, Hanover had shipbuilding. There were 11 shipyards in the North River. A uh, friend of mine uh, recently bought a property that was one of the old shipyards, Barstow's Two Oaks, and he's pulled up all sorts of bits of iron, including a six-foot pit saw, um, still intact. So this is the sort of perfect example of what these maps were like when they were created. As you can see, it's pretty basic, but the boundaries are very precise. The dimensions are almost perfectly um, compatible with the modern boundaries if you look at a modern map of Hanover. So that's what's really amazing about the work that was done. You know, when you think you had to be out there and you had less than a year to sort of get this done. You see he's waving. And these aren't professional surveyors or professional cartographers. Most of them are self-taught. Just like Washington, what they would do is they would buy a book on surveying. Uh, there was the Complete Surveyor's Manual from 1670s. There was another one called Geodesia, um, published in the 1760s. So you get a copy of that, and it explains how you do surveying. 
And that's how they taught themselves. You know, today when you drive around, you see the surveyors out on the side of the road. You know, I really want to stop and bring out the surveyor's compass, and it's probably not that much different. I have a friend who teaches surveying and geography up at UMaine Orono, and he was saying the same principles are still used when you're out surveying, uh, the same basic tools. The surveyor's compass is actually called a circumferentor, which is a really fun term, um, but the same principles of direction and distance are being used when we lay out maps today. Now, here is the map of your beloved Bridgewater. It doesn't look very impressive on first sight, but it is a fantastic document that really gives you a sense of the history of this town, these towns, in the period. Now, the surveyor's name is not given, and it does look like it's been sort of patched up over, the, over time, but, and it's... This photo right here doesn't show how you know, uh, clearly the lines are delineated. But this is a perfect example of a snapshot of a Massachusetts town from 1795. And you can, we'll jump in a little close here. <laughs> the writing is pretty good. A plan of the town of Bridgewater. Um, taken pursuant to an act of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, by the selectmen of said town, upon order of the selectmen, per order Beza Hayward, one of the selectmen. Uh, Hayward's an old, old name in this area. Um, so you can see, still got some Haywards around. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's really funny, the, you know, all these towns around here, having worked in Plymouth at, at Pilgrim Hall Museum and having worked in Hanover, it's funny how often the, some of the families who showed up 1640s never left. <laughs> They're still here. Um, and it's great when that sense of history comes through because you can look back and see and know exactly who the people were who were doing this work. Um, I wish... Beza Hayward had written down uh, who did the survey because that would be a great detail to know. Now they included small details and facts on these maps. Now this is the detail from the Bridgewater map and what it says is they have um, field notes right here. These are all the uh, degrees and dimensions for the boundaries on out, you know, with each surrounding town. So the first one, uh, Randolph, south 69 degrees, 45 minutes, west 365 rods. They're being as precise as possible in listing out all the possible information about the boundaries of the town. Uh, Randolph, Stoughton, Easton, Raynham, they go down through Middleborough, lots of boundary with Middleborough, Halifax, Pembroke, and Abington and the degrees and minutes based on the um, latitude. Um, so remember, this is a time when longitude is still trying to be figured out, um, particularly at ocean. Over here, references for the map list um, by numbers, grist mills, sawmill, fulling mills, forges, furnaces, slitting mills, air furnace, and bridges. So when you see the corresponding number on the map, you know that that's where a grist mill was, or a sawmill. Uh, a fulling mill was a mill for uh, cleaning cloth, wool cloth. Uh, it would have a big hammer that sort of pounded the cloth clean with water. Um, furnaces, slitting mills for processing iron, an air furnace, and then the bridges. And reputed distance from the center of the town to the metropolis, Boston, 28 miles. Ditto to the Shire Town, Plymouth, 18 miles. Shire Town being the seat of county government, um, which was Plymouth at the time. So 28 miles up to Boston, 18 over to Plymouth. The basic distances. And these were what were required on these maps. But now, let's look at some details. We start in the north. 
Here is the North Meeting House and Furnace Brook um, with the Town Brook above it. And you can see a couple of the numbers for the various mills in the area. So the North Meeting House, this is downtown Brockton. Uh, and you can see the, the Bridgewater map is really fantastic because I was trying to trace out some of the old roads and these roads, we still use them. I drove on a couple of them <laughs> coming down here. Um, so you can see what is most important, the Meeting House. Now, one of the things to remember about the landscapes, particularly of these towns in the 1790s, is they were a lot more open than they are now, a lot more fields than trees. We tend to forget about this, but if you look at pictures even up uh, you know, from the 1890s, 1900s, it's pretty open. You, know, you can see good distances. We don't have that anymore. You know, the, the roads are so you know, grown, uh, you know, the trees have grown back so much in the past 150 years. So this was open territory, open country. So the Meeting House steeple was a recognizable landmark you know, for miles around. And the bells up in the steeples would be used for not only calling for church services, but for emergencies, uh, for funerals, for all sorts of alarms. So right there, you get that real sense of what this place is like in the 1790s, how different it is from nowadays. Here is the West Meeting House, uh, along with the Baptist Meeting House over here. here, the Powder Magazine. Powder magazines were built in most of the towns uh, in Massachusetts for housing the stock of powder, muskets, flints, everything that the local militia would need. And you can see in this one, uh, Magazine West, Meeting House, Baptist Meeting House, the Town River, right here, and the Episcopal Meeting House. If you're writing the history of the churches in this area, these maps give you a fairly clear view of where they were located. There's always the one meeting house in the center of the town or center of the precinct or neighborhood. The Baptist and Episcopalians usually on the outside a little bit, you know, put but a few miles away. Um, same thing with Hanover. Uh, when the Episcopalian church moves into town in 1811, it's over in Four Corners and not in the center of town. So there again, you can find these interesting, fascinating little details uh, about the towns based on this rather simple map. So here is the um, South Meeting House? East, East, yep, East Meeting House. And you have Satucket right below it. You have the Marshfield River here, uh, as well as Forge Brook. Uh, and the Plymouth Road down here. It's funny how the names of some roads have stayed the same. Plymouth Road, Plymouth Street. Um, road to whichever town. We still have Hanover Street and Rockland Street in Hanover. These simple details, uh, you know, like I said, they're still with us today you know, from this time period. So East Bridgewater, West Bridgewater, we did North Bridgewater, and down in Main Bridgewater, You have the South Meeting House, right in the center. Overlaps with the Episcopalian Meeting House up there. The Town River, Plymouth Road, the Great River over here. Um, the South Brook, and the road to Middleborough and New Bedford. I think it's um, really interesting that they label that road the road to Middleborough and New Bedford because New Bedford is still a very young town at this time. But in the 1790s, it is growing in importance and popularity because of the whaling industry. Bridgewater has iron forges. Their iron is being sent down to supply the whale ships out of 
New Bedford and Middleborough. So you can see the tracks of the roads. And they took really great care in really trying to be as accurate as possible with these roads. Now, when you think about it, 1795, most people are walking uh, or they're riding in an ox cart. Or if they're lucky, they have a horse with maybe you know, a couple of horses with a couple of carts or wagons or carriages. <clears throat> you know, we might want to think of the big romantic, you know, big carriages, but very few people would actually have those. Well, most of your travel is done walking or ox cart or a simple one horse carriage or one horse wagon. A lot slower <laughs> pace than today. I recently had restored at the Hanover Historical Society two of our 19th century carriages. And, you know, these beautiful, a beautiful Surrey and a little doctor's buggy. And just pulling them around, you get the sense of how much, much slower um, travel was, even in the 1790s. You know, we think, you know, we think nothing nowadays of, oh, I got to drive to Rhode Island. Yeah, okay, you got to drive to Maine, you know. Remember, so, when you think about the lives of people at this time, think about how much more of an effort it was to travel. Uh, my wife took my son this morning to go down to Mystic, Connecticut. Yeah, no problem. But 1790s, that would have taken a couple of days if we were walking, if we were lucky. People were still traveling by boat most of the time. For an inland community like the Bridgewaters, Farming is the most important industry, but you've got to get your farm goods and manufactured goods to a bigger metropolis, right? That 28 miles to Boston, it takes a while if you're on a cart or walking a horse or an ox. So when you look at these maps, they really give you a sense of, you know, not only the history, but how different things are nowadays uh, from what they were like 100 or 200 or 300 years ago. Waterfront property has always been important, so they always put in the ponds. This is Nipponicket Pond, uh, reputed 1,000 acres, uh, right in the corner of Bridgewater, right next to the Raynham Line. Um, you can see, it says, let's see. Nukatesset Pond, Nipponicket Pond, reputed 100 acres. Uh, and with one of the other roads coming right in here. Ponds, of course, are important for as water features of the geography. And rivers with bridges. That's why the bridges are always identified. They are always marked. You can see here is Titicut Bridge down here along the Titicut River. There's Woodward's Bridge uh, and Child's Bridge up over there. And there's the road to Middleborough and New Bedford going down that way. And Sawmill Brook. <laughs> Sometimes they didn't get very creative with the names. Forge Brook, Sawmill Brook. Up on the North River, we have First Herring Brook, Second Herring Brook, Third Herring Brook. <laughs> they didn't even try to come up with a good name. But when you think about it, it's what's the, the importance? Obviously, the herring were very important along the North River. The forges, the sawmills, and that is those local associations are what gave the names to some of our physical features in the geography around here. Um, <coughs> someday I would love to sort of do a comparison of, uh, you know, walking down a road versus riding a horse versus, you know, riding a car now. When you see all the traffic on like a, a Saturday or Sunday afternoon like this, and try to imagine what it looked like 200 years ago, before cars, with one little carriage walking, you know, being walked down the street. So, here is the other one. This is Robin's Pond, reputed 300 acres. Um, and it's, it's funny how it, they do the reputed 1,000 acres, or a thought to be. Uh, 300 acres, and you see this on other survey maps of the period as well. It's, it's funny, I, I almost, it's almost like they 
produced some form of template that all these surveyors were using in towns all across the Commonwealth. Because uh, a lot of them have the same um, labels, the same terminology, the same sort of designs uh, that you see in this one. Now what's great about these maps is, like I said, they're all online and they've been scanned at huge sizes. So you can pull up the, so much detail, you can even see this, the pattern right there. That's the pattern in the paper itself from the chains when the paper was, was made. Um, I haven't been able to see any of the watermarks on the paper yet, but hopefully we'll find some of those. Maybe you can identify where the paper came from. These extraordinary maps, uh, you know, they're, they're paper and they've been mounted onto linen, uh, so they have been preserved. But when you think about it, they're really, uh, it's amazing that they have been preserved up at the State Archives. They are you know, part of the history of the Commonwealth in this area. They're also great indicators of just how much our geography has changed. Um, you know, Hanover itself used to be nothing but a bunch of dairy farms and a bunch of horse farms uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, there's one story, a uh, lady in town said she and her little brother used to sit on the front step of their house on Main Street on the off chance that a car might drive by. <laughs> and that's the early 40s, um, you know, during, during World War II. And Hanover, Pembroke, the town uh, where I grew up, you know, I can remember in the 70s, you know, half the time coming down West Elm, the Peterson's cow would be in the middle of the street, you know, so you'd have to go up and knock on the door and the kid would come out and she in the road again. Um, and out here in Bridgewater, you're fortunate, you still have a lot of these old farms and farm areas. And they're really, you know, starting to disappear in a lot of places. Um, we, that's why we were so lucky to save Sylvester Field uh, there in Hanover. It's basically thanks to the lady who lived next door to it in 1956. She bought the property with the intention that it would be preserved and never built on. When you see how much a lot of these towns are built up, Using these maps, you can see you know, how spread out um, a lot of the communities were, how distant neighbors were you know, from one to another. We're so used to neighbors being you know, stone's throw away. Um, and with these maps, you can really get the sense of this was an agricultural area. Most people were farmers. Um, and with all that that <coughs> entailed, there were the small industries, um, but you know, in the 19th century, all that would change, as we've seen. Uh, and then into the 20th century, where we've become, you know, almost all of the towns are suburban towns for Boston and the surrounding area. So I will happily go back to, s if you want to see some of these details, because uh, this map is fantastic, and I'm thinking all of you know these ma this area a lot better than I do. Uh, so let's jump back a couple. Here we are. So, this is that's the, the West Meeting House. Um, so, was that located um, right around here, correct? Yep. So, you can see we're right along the river. Um, so, we're what? Right about one of these two bridges where we are right now? Between the two. Between the two? Mm -hmm. What would be a fun project is, like I said, taking these maps and you know, overlaying them a, on a modern map uh, to see you know, if things ha have changed, if the meeting houses have moved, uh, you know, the location of the churches, or if some of the, the forges are still there. Yes? It's, uh, it's actually brown ink. Um, ink in the 18th century uh, could, was often, uh, you'd have a powder, um, sometimes made from oak galls, you know those little puffy little paper balls you see in the woods? Um, you take those, and those have long been used, you soak them, and that produces an ink, uh, and you can add a little bit of like metal filings to it to make a dark 
brown or a dark black ink. Uh, ink was often powdered at the time, so you'd use a little um, metal nib and you'd have your ink well. Paper would be mostly imported, but the 1790s, once again, in that period when things were changing, uh, Crane and a few other printing um, or paper makers started to appear throughout the, the, throughout the United States. So yeah, they brought out a lap desk and they would mark off everything as carefully as possible. Um, ink would probably get everywhere. I often have, when the third graders come through Stetson House, I have them try to write with a quill pen. The ink gets everywhere, it's great. It's all over them too. Um, and you know, very few, very few of them know how to do their name and handwritten, handwriting, you know, cursive anymore. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. So as you point out, it's pretty hard to fast to do the survey, and it's pretty impressive. And also you point out it's fairly accurate, but you know there's some cases where where it's not. I think one example is the the uh That's, that's actually a great question. That's probably the next step is, you know, because obviously you have to work with the neighboring town, with the boundaries. Uh, and there are cases well into the 19th century of towns, you know, going to court over boundaries. Um, uh, I know Hanover had a couple squabbles with Abington for a while. So that's the next step is seeing, you know, comparing these, these boundary maps, these surveys, with the town records, with the court records. You know, was this a cause of contention? And a lot of, t I mean, the, the property is so valuable, and particularly, you know, at the time, things like salt marsh. They were always going to court over salt marsh and hay marshes. Um, so I would imagine there'd be a lot of squabbling between the towns, particularly among the selectmen. That's a great question. Was there another one in the back? My name is Bob Boyd, and I do historic deed research. Oh, nice. Since 1994. Mm -hmm. And I work for a lawyer at Plymouth Registry of Deeds mm -hmm. for six years, two days a week, nine hours a day mm -hmm. to do that. It's important for you people that have property is to take your property dimensions on there and start at one point, follow the drawing around your property, and make sure the points come together. On my deal, if they came almost together, it was fine for me. I would say, go see a surveyor. I have a property down in Bowen that we had difficult, well, potential difficult with neighbors next door. So I ended up having a survey and markets put in that are visible, not the iron rod in the ground that you have to get a magnet to find it, but a stone that you actually can see. Luckily, both properties turned out fine. Got a brand new neighbor, built a house last year on what was, took down the old house, and it was gone anyhow. But I work for the National Air and Space Museum, Smithsonian, as librarian. But in the process of dealing with people around, they take a trip, come back with a map of where they went. I have a file cabinet right now, full of maps of all over the United States, and some in Canada, and some, I went to Moscow, got a city map of Moscow, and St. Petersburg. That's in the drawers now. But doing deed research is very interesting. Uh, the assessors were assigned to a friend of mine, Bill Bassett, uh, request payment of taxes on a piece of property off uh, Vernon Street between Vernon and uh, Pine. There's two acres. And they kept saying, and he kept saying, it's not mine. No, it's not mine. So I did. I went back to the census. Found a Bill Bassett, because Bill Bassett, the original Bill Bassett, 
came over either Mayflower or one of those other ships and came into Bridgewater and you see Bill Bassett. So it's probably that family, but I lost him from, I found him in 1920 census, lost him in 1930, haven't gone back. So I know it's, it's not my Bill Bassett. That, uh, but it's been interesting doing deed research for Richard for all these years. And as I say, I've been doing historic deed research, looking at properties. Somebody says, how old is my house? Well, I can't tell you how old the house is, except for my father-in-law's house. The lot was sold in 1878, and it came out of Bates High and Cotton Gin Manufacturing that uh, ended up on Pearl Street from there. And the 1879 map of Bridgewater has a house on it, drawn out. Not with the bond attached, the bond was down in the backyard. And it probably looks the same as today. The deeds, um, when I worked at Pilgrim Hall, Pilgrim Hall had the other Bridgewater deed, the other copy of it. Um, so we had that conserved many years ago. And that wonderful description of, you know, from this river to this tree to this uh, pile of stones, and for the, you know, the couple of coats and the axe heads that, yeah, the Massasoit, Usamequins, you know, sold this whole property for. Um, deeds are fascinating, and in combining with genealogy and historic maps that are all online now, it's so much easier to, for people to research their own homes, their properties. Um, a lot of people in Hanover, and I can imagine here, you know, they'll move to town, they'll buy an old house, they want to know who was there. And those, those eight, the 1879 atlas of Plymouth County, the 1903, uh, the Sanborn maps, maps are incredible for the information that they can really convey uh, when you s start looking at them so closely. Um, and then combining them with the deeds, with um, modern deeds. The registry has deeds online that you can search too. I usually get lost after a couple, but, um, <laughs> but it's, it's fascinating uh, you know, how you can create these stories. I always thought it was kind of odd that they'd have a town called Hanover named when it was named considering the recent unpleasantness between the side of the ocean and the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hanover was uh, named in 1727, named for the House of Hanover, the King George I. Um, it's, it's funny, the names of the towns around here, um, you know, Bridgewater is pretty straightforward. Um, Hanover, um, uh, Pembroke, Originally, the inhabitants of Pembroke wanted a different name for the town, uh, like Brookfield or something, but there was already a Brookfield, so they were given a couple possibilities <laughs> by, t by royal officials. So during the Revolution, Hanover just kind of stuck. Um, it was already a known town. And there are Hanovers in New Hampshire, Michigan, Pennsylvania. I sometimes get calls for a very different Hanover Historical Society. <laughs> They're looking for New Hampshire or Pennsylvania sometimes. Yep. Hanover. Yeah. Yeah. And that wasn't Hanover Street during the Revolution. Right. Yeah, it was a couple different names. Yeah. Do you have a question too?
outside the archives. Outside the archives of Bridgewater State University. Maximum life. So it's like the third floor, I believe. Yeah. yeah. On the third floor. So I, anyway, I wanted to make a pitch for that so that anybody who's interested in seeing what was happening in 1857 here in the county. Secondly, okay, we talked all about surveying, but I am absolutely at a loss as to what they actually did, how you survey. Okay, you have a compass, the guy's looking through Thing. You've got chains. I don't get it. <laughs> okay. Can you explain? Sure, sure. It's just like the gentleman was saying. You start at one point, um, an agreed on point, and from there you use the surveyor's compass. Well, so how do you know where, what the direction should be? That's what the. Um, Does that mean you are uh, no, you use the compass to establish directions. So uh, you're starting uh, directions of what? North and south. Oh, okay. So yeah. general geographic directions. Yeah. There are specific boundaries or, or markers that they would have used and then basically charted out their direction from then. So just like sailing a ship, if you have to go certain degrees north or south or east but or west. How do they know where to go north or south? Well, with, with the towns around here, a lot of the boundaries had already been in existence for a while. So corners were marked, and they just moved from the corner to the next corner, following the uh, descriptions in deeds. Okay, so they have a deed, mm -hmm. and they have to do, pull out, figure out where all the deeds are, patch them together in a, some kind of chronological order, in order to go zigzag the and a lot of the, lot of the Plymouth Colony records, a lot of the town records, at least half of them have to deal with property lines. Point, which then they would say, okay, we need to go, um, you know, five chain lengths in this direction west uh, till we reach a certain point um, at a certain latitude and that's how they use these to sort of guide them. Okay, so if they didn't have the deeds, they wouldn't know where they were. Well, the property owners would be there, the people who own the properties. A lot of these are, the, the boundaries had already been established um, much earlier. So basically what they're doing is creating these survey maps based on property lines that had already existed for decades. So they're creating these new maps using the, the surveyor's equipment um, and just to give it a more accurate version, an updated version. Okay. So theoretically, it should tie to the previous ones. Yeah. Even? Yeah. So to, to add on to Kathy's question, they're there, they're surveying right along, and then all of a sudden, they're at the edge of a lake. How do they go through the lake through their extension of, of chains to get to the other side? They'll measure around the perimeter of the lake and coordinate with the directions on the other side with this, the, based on latitude, figuring out latitude. Yeah. On a reference point, two things. Uh, I think some of the uh, earlier uh, measurements would start like with the southwest corner of the Mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. But to get back to those hundred acre things you were talking in the uh, Midwest, there is an actual marker in a town called East Liverpool, Ohio, from which all those dimensions emanate. And it's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. The, the, when they did the land ordinance for the Northwest Territories, they were much, um, you know, they were working almost with a blank slate. So they had that that stone and they could mark off from there. So here, you know, it was a little bit trickier because the towns had been established, you know, sort of piecemeal um, in the previous century. Yeah. Boundaries of Bridgewater. Nice. You can come out and take a
Yeah. This is still required by most towns in the Commonwealth to this day. Uh, sort of almost like a ceremonial thing. You go out and you check where the old boundaries are, those markers on the corners that mark off you know, separate divisions of the towns. So, well, thank you all very much. I don't want to keep you inside on a beautiful day much longer. <laughs>